like that. He didn't get any in his lungs. Uh, but my attending said, hey, give him some Decatron. Uh, and it does help. Well, you know what I did? I bolstered it real quick because it comes in a one milligram vial, or one cc vial, 10 milligrams. Bolstered real quick. And as he's waking up, oh, my butt itches. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> and actually, you know, we read about it, but we don't see it because I'm always giving it. Usually I give it early, so we induce, and then I'm giving antibiotics, and I give a little dexamethasone, so you don't ever think about the perianal itching because the patient's under general anesthesia, um, but as they're <laughs> merging, you can't. Um, Metoclopramide, another agent we use uh, right for, for nausea, you'll see promethazine or fenergan as well, an antihistamine that we can use for, for POMB. The scopolamine patches you do see we do a lot, anticholinergic patches can help with that. They usually stay on for about three days, the biggest thing is because of the choliner, anticholinergic, they get the, uh, the dry mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife had that for, for a couple of days after her surgery. And it, I'm sure, she's like, man, I feel great, but my mouth's dry. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so we can get that scope patch on. And then the last agent is the neurokinin 1 receptor antagonist, the anfopretin uh, that we use. Uh, you'll see it, like I said, for our colorectal cases a lot. Now going into sort of interoperative things, inhalational uh, anesthetics that we use. We got three three big ones, so, uh, these volatiles, uh, and then we have the nitrous, okay? So the volatile gases, we really don't know how they work, unfortunately. We're still trying to look into that. Um, but it likely enhances those in inhibitory uh, channels um, or receptors within the brain. So GABA, NMDA, glycine, for example, is another one, uh, or it attenuates those excitatory. It can allow in the spinal cord for skeletal muscle relaxation, uh, which is helpful. Uh, it is a very potent trigger for malignant hypothermia uh, as well. What I've got on here talks about minimal alveolar concentration, or MAC as we call it. Um, what that states is within the lungs, we're measuring this um, in exhalational, so expiration we're managing, um, measuring this, this dose. Uh, and what it says is that an atmosphere of, of one atmosphere of pressure uh, that is equivalent. Um, this number, for example, is where 50% of patients wouldn't move to uh, surgical stimulation, meaning they're anesthetized appropriately, that they would not move to surgical stimulation. And that is one MAC, is what we call it. So you're able to dose it appropriately. But if I'm using muscle relaxations, right, and muscle relaxants, then I may not need to give as much. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure that our patient's not aware. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, 0.5 to 0.6 MAC is what we like to hang around with. And then we also age, or, uh, age adjust this, this number. Okay. Inhalational anesthetics, all of them cause some vasodilation, so you see some hypotension with them um, as well. So the four agents we use, sevoflurane, non-pungent, sweet smelling in a sense, but I will tell the kids it's monkey gas um, <laughs> as they blow up my green balloon. Uh, it's a very rapidly fast-acting uptake and elimination. Um, so I use it when this is the agent you see we use for all inhalational inductions. Um, it's, it's more expensive than isoflurane, but less expensive than desflurane. So it's a pretty good agent right in the middle. Isoflurane, very pungent, cheap. Um, so we use it for a lot of our longer cases, cardiac cases, spine cases, if you need, if you're using inhalational anesthesia, liver transplants. Um, so very very pungent smelling, but uh, at least it's a good agent to use. Desflurane, one in the blue can per se, as we call it. It's low potent, um, so it's not as strong as the others. It's um, very, very pungent, more than isoflurane. It's quick on, quick off. Uh, the biggest concerns about, about desflurane, number one, is it's very expensive. Number two is it, um, given its pungency, it's irritating to the bronchioles. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can actually lead to, to bronchospasm, laryngospasm, uh, a lot of coughing with it. It's got some, um, well, it's enhancement of the, of the sympathetic nervous system in a sense, so you may get some tachycardia and hypertension as well um, early on. So I actually had a young lady that was doing like a laparoscopic appendectomy one night, turned it on, was going to use it as a quicker agent. She wasn't too obese, um, but I thought, okay, let's, you know, middle of the night, we're going to use inhalational anesthesia, and then um, get her appendix out and be done. Well, lo and behold, we're getting through it, and all of a sudden she starts tacking up, getting like 110s, 120s, and she's hypertensive, and I'm like, hmm, this doesn't seem right. Lo and behold, it was the agent. 
turned it off, turned the little Siva flaring on, and she relaxed right on down. Um, nitrous oxide is our other agent. Laughing gas is most used here. Uh, a lot of dentists will use it. We use it a lot too. Um, very, it's low potent. You very, very low potent, so you never can get a mac of gas on that. So you have to use another agent with nitrous. Contributes to POMV, and then it can diffuse into air filled cavities. Is the biggest part. So if I'm using it, I've always got to check the the, tube, the balloon on the breathing tube because it can diffuse in there and cause a tracheal injury. Uh, can't use it in a trauma patient because it can diffuse into the, the pneumothorax that could be there. Mm -hmm. Can't use it in the middle of your surgery because it's diffuse there as well. Are all of those able to be flavored? You know, where a lot of the pediatrics they yeah. Do? So actually, not flavored in a sense. <laughs> Zero fluorine mm -hmm. is, uh, but it's a good point because we do. That's what I'm saying. The gas isn't flavored, but we can put something in the mask to make it smell good. So okay. we have um, like essential oil or something like that to mm -hmm. wipe in the mask. Mm -hmm. So we have one over in chore, it's raspberry for, you know, mm -hmm. smell or something like that that I used before. A lot of times, especially the younger kids, mm -hmm. um, the thing is we do a mask induction is, in a sense, bite the bullet, but go to sleep real quick because it's so rapid. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will sometimes put, them, put a little smell in there if mm -hmm. they're talking to you. Yeah, I know um, I'm, my children have had surgery, and yeah. they were excited to pick their flavor. Yes, so. <laughs> well, so we do. A lot of times, it depends on the age. If they're right. to tell me, hey, I'll, can I pick my flavor? Mm -hmm. like, sure, I'll offer it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, every, every anesthetic right. is, is tailored to that patient. Mm -hmm. so we go from there. Uh, IV fluids, okay, we all use those. That is a medication, just like even oxygen is a medication. Um, biggest, you know, couple, three that we use around here. Lactated ringers, uh, it's a balanced salt solution. Uh, I enjoy that as my, my fluid um, choice, usually. Um, normal saline or sodium chloride at 0.9% uh, is another agent. I tend to use that just for my neurosurgical patients. Uh, the reason is because they try to limit the, the flux um, uh, of fluids in and out, so the swelling of cerebral edema. And that's due, and I put on there 154 million equivalents of sodium and 100 Billy equivalents of chloride. And so that's where it can, uh, you try to get that appropriate balance. Because, right, our most sodiums in our body is 140, right? Mm -hmm. Normal is 135 to 145 mm -hmm. billy equivalents. So try to get in that range. The sodium level of lactated ringers is 130. So if it's less than normal, then you can get water will then go with the, the higher concentration of milli equivalents. So therefore, it causes cerebral edema. So you tend to use sodium chloride. In if you're resuscitating with sodium chloride, you can get a uh, hyperchloremic, meaning elevated chloride levels, and causing a metabolic acidosis. So, tend not to use that if I'm resuscitating. Septic patients, trauma patients, try to use LR or blood products. That's mm -hmm. what I use. Albumin is one of our colloid solutions, meaning it's got the albumin of protein within it. Um, use it as a volume expander, as those proteins allow to stay in the intravascular volume a little longer. I put down here this maintenance calculation. Uh, we use it to try to, count, to calculate what the, the um, volume per hour I need to give a patient. So this, we call it the 421 rule. So for the first 10 kilograms of someone, you get four cc's per kilo. For the second 10 kilos, four, two cc's per kilo. And then for the remaining greater than 20 kilos, one cc per kilo. Or you do the shortcut, and it's if they're greater than 20 kilos, their body weight plus 40. And it's usually their ideal body weight. So if someone who's uh, 150 kilograms, I'm not gonna give them 190 cc's an hour of fluid, rather give them something a little less at their ideal, so probably 125. There is a question about that, which I can't specifically recall, but the yeah. one thing is on there. It's on there, yeah. Uh, we're going to a little basic anesthetic, anesthetic monitoring, so uh, now we're out of the common medication, I guess, topic, so talk about some anesthetic monitoring. Um, first thing is first, our standards within the ASA, qualified anesthesia personnel should be present in the room to conduct all general anesthetics, regional anesthetics, or this monitored anesthesia care, okay? And then our standard two, if we're, as we're monitoring these, uh, then during all these, the patient's oxygenation, ventilation, uh, circulation, and temperature shall be monitored uh, continuously. Uh, and that means even a pulse ox tone, uh, so hearing what the pulse ox level is, an end tidal CO2 or the carbon dioxide to measure ventilation, disconnect alarm, 
the EKG, a blood pressure at least every five minutes. Most of us at induction run two and a half to three. We get comfortable and have a very stable patient. We'll count it back to five, okay? Uh, and that's to measure that circulatory assessment. And then the temperature. Uh, and use force, or force, force warm air, um, the force warm air, air forced air warming. <laughs> Uh, anesthesia types, for example, and these are the 2018 guidelines from the ASA. Uh, so four different levels, uh, the three within monitored anesthesia care, minimal sedation, moderate sedation, and deep sedation, and then as well as general anesthesia. So we'll go over those shortly. Um, so the minimal sedation is just taking away some anxiety. You may just that one or two milligrams of Versed. The patient's as need, able to talk to you, respond to you. They probably don't remember anything. They're able to protect their airway blood pressure and things aren't taken away. A lot of times this minimal sedation is usually when we're doing our spinals, our arteries, or nerve blocks. It's tend to what we're doing, so a small procedure. If I'm doing moderate sedation or conscious sedation, we call it, uh, used to be, if you have, they have purposeful movements if they're stimulated, um, shouldn't have to intervene on their airway at all, and uh, so they're maintaining their spine, uh, adequate spontaneous ventilation, may need to support them with a little oxygen, that's okay. Uh, but that also helps us maintain and monitor their entitled CO2. And then their cardiovascular function is usually maintained, so no hypotension or heart rate problems. Deep sedation or analgesia from that aspect, uh, you have to repeatedly stimulate them to get a purposeful response. You may need to intervene on their airway, which means they may not be able to protect uh, their, or have inadequate spontaneous ventilation. And occasionally you may get some hypotension, but it's usually maintained. And then last but not least, if you do general anesthesia, which sometimes we do general anesthesia without a breathing device, um, or sometimes they call it a room air general, it happens. Um, sometimes you have to intervene on the airway. You have, may not be able to spontaneously or protect their own airway. may need to fix some hypotension with fluid or vasopressors, uh, and they're usually unarousable to, to surgical stimulation. Now on just a little bit of topics about special population management. Are we doing okay with time? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so morbid obesity, just one topic we see a lot, especially doing um, gastric bypass surgeries and things like that here, uh, bariatric surgery. Biggest things I'm concerned about with these patients, their narcotics use. I want to limit them because of most of them have obstructive sleep apnea for these patients. And even Presidex, for example, like you mentioned, that may not, you know, want to be careful how much sedation post-operatively we give them because then they can lead to a respiratory event. Uh, they also could have a trouble with uh, intubation, for example, so I have to try to position them appropriately to make the easiest and safest way to place the breathing tube under general anesthesia. Anyone who smokes, so they've already damaged their lungs at that point, they may have COPD, so I could have trouble with uh, ventilation and oxygenating these patients. My chronic alcohol users, they're going to require a little more anesthesia. The reason is because alcohol affects that GABA receptors as well. Okay. Uh, opioid users, if they're on chronic, even if they're on a five milligram of oxycodone, or the patients who um, have used heroin the other day, or unfortunately on a, a pain management program, they're going to require uh, adjustments in their in their medications. Okay. And they're on a buprenorphine. We have some recommendations now to kind of wean them off appropriately um, because what's happened is more or less they have, they're using their mu receptors. Mm -hmm. So now they're already soaked up and I can't treat anymore. So we have to think of other pain options. Does that mean using ketamine, magnesium to hit it, there's NMDA, Presidex, the NMDA receptor as well. Um, let's see what other options that we have. You know, gabapentin, mm -hmm. Tylenol, uh, NSAIDs, Ketorolac, things like that, try to use those options. Uh, the stroke to prolonged immobility wouldn't use any suctional choline like we talked about. The elderly patients, usually if they're greater than about 60 or 65, probably wouldn't use a benzodiazepine unless they were severely anxious and I would use a lower dose. So I try to dose those appropriately. Try to limit the narcotics on those patients as well, uh, but appropriately treat their pain. Uh, cardiac patients, any type of cardiac pathology, you have to be very careful of how we dose our, our uh, anesthesia because of the cardiac suppressive effects. So you have to think about those pathophysiology. And then if someone who has uh, malignant hyperthermia, and this is where I wanted to give a little couple seconds on what malignant hyperthermia is. 
Um, so it's a severe reaction uh, to succinylcholine or volatile anesthetics that um, that are really related to the it's an R Y R one gene. So it's an abnormality of that.